Welcome to Sports Illustrated's Experts Corner. I'm Andrew Perloff, and we're talking NFL Draft. Let's talk about Trent Richardson, the Alabama running back. Now, you're seeing him as high as number five in a lot of mock drafts. I think this is way too high for any running back. I think Trent's great. I think he's going to be a good NFL player. But you just can't draft running backs in the first round. Look at the recent history. Richardson's teammate, Mark Ingram, he did nothing to help New Orleans last year. Look at Beanie Wells, Noshaw Moreno, CJ Spill. You go down and down the list until you get to Adrian Peterson. Now, Peterson's great. Guess what? Richardson's no Adrian Peterson. I know people are comparing them, but nobody has that breakaway speed like Adrian Peterson. And even the Vikings aren't in the Super Bowl with Adrian Peterson. So what is Richardson going to do for you? Today's league is about passing. You need running backs who can do a lot of things. Pick up blitzes, catch passes. Now Richardson can do that, but I don't think he does it so much better than all the other running backs that you need to take him that high. I would wait second or third round if I needed a running back. And when you're talking about the four pick or the five pick, you need an absolute game changer. A guy that defenses are gonna have to account for. Say Cleveland took Richardson to number four, Guess what? They have no wide receivers and they have some issues at quarterback. So they're just going to put nine in the box and Richardson's not going anywhere anyway. I know it's tempting because he's so good, but smart teams will win. We're going to talk about three overrated NFL draft prospects, starting with Memphis defensive tackle Don Terry Poe. Now, Poe came out of nowhere at the NFL scouting combine and ran a 4 9 40. That's pretty impressive for a huge man and teams noticed. But now we're seeing him top 10. He was not a dominant force at Memphis. And if you can't dominate in Conference USA, you're not going to dominate in the NFL. I think this is a classic workout wonder, and I think he'll fall a little bit come draft day. Let's look at Boston College linebacker Luke Keekley. Now, you're seeing him in mock drafts anywhere from 10 to 15. This is common for an inside linebacker to go higher in mock drafts than you actually see him on draft day. Gets a lot of attention in college, a lot of tackles, but tacklers are a dime a dozen in the NFL, and inside linebackers often fall. It's all about rushing the quarterback. And guess how many sacks Keekley had in 2011? Zero. So I don't think teams are looking for that particular skill set that high in the draft. Let's move on to Notre Dame wide receiver Michael Floyd. Let's face it, football writers love Notre Dame products. They're always slotted too high, and I think Floyd is a classic example. Yes, he runs very well, and he's big and tall, and he looks like a great receiver, but I don't think you saw that production on game tape. You don't see the separation you want out of an elite receiver. Floyd's a legit bottom of the first round prospect, maybe top of the second round, but you're seeing him as high as number eight to the Dolphins. He will not produce like a number eight overall pick. Now nothing's more exciting than when Roger Goodell comes up to the podium and announces a trade. I think we're gonna see a lot of that this year. With a rookie slotting system, teams aren't afraid of top 10 picks like they used to be because they don't have to break the bank to sign them. We've already seen one move. St. Louis traded with Washington so the Redskins could move up and take RG3 at quarterback. I think you're going to see a few more moves. Now, there are rumors that teams might want to get up to number three with Minnesota and take Texas A&M quarterback Ryan Tannehill. Now, Minnesota said some things at the Combine that made you believe they're shopping that pick. The Vikings have so many needs that they don't need the number three pick. They can help their team throughout the first round. And that's a trend these days. It's more about stockpiling. Look at the New England Patriots. They always have multiple first round picks and I think everybody wants to be like New England. You look at number four, Cleveland, another team with lots of needs. They have the four pick and the 22 pick. You know what? They could move down in the first round and get guys around 10 and 15 and really strengthen a lot of holes in their lineup. Or they can move up with that 22 and get a big time running back and a big time quarterback. Then you go to number five, Tampa Bay. You know, they like Trent Richardson, the running back. They like Justin Blackman, the wide receiver. They need help on defense. I expect them to try and maybe look at moving down and filling several holes on the defensive side of the ball instead of taking one playmaker. And then you have to go down to number eight, Miami Dolphins. They're desperate for a quarterback. They're pretty desperate for a wide receiver. And I'm not sure eight is the perfect spot for either. Because they're not going to get Tannehill. They're probably not going to get Justin Blackman. And it may be too high for the number two receiver, Michael Floyd. So they're going to look to move around. I expect a lot of wheeling and dealing in the top 10 this year. So when you look at a mock draft, keep in mind, it might be inaccurate because the teams might not be picking where you think. Let's start with an unusual one, SMU tight end Taylor Thompson. Now when he was in college, Thompson played defensive end. And after the season at an all-star game, coaches tried him out at tight end and they liked what they saw. The guy ran an incredible 40 for a big man and people are comparing him to Rob Gronkowski. 
with every team looking for a tight end, someone might take a risk on Thompson as high as the second or third round. Now let's move to quarterback, Michigan State's Kirk Cousins. Now you're hearing his name a lot. People say he doesn't really have the big arm strength to be a first round kind of guy, and he probably will go in the second or third round. But I think he can be a productive quarterback in the NFL for a long time. The player he reminds me of, Tom Brady. Now I know that's high praise, but Cousins is a guy who's not gonna impress you with his physical skills, but he's got leadership and mental toughness. And I think some team is really gonna appreciate them when they get him in camp. Now let's move to the defensive side of the ball. Nebraska defensive lineman Jared Crick has fallen this year because of a pec injury. He was a first round prospect who didn't play last year, but guess what? I think you're gonna see him return to the form that he had early in his career, and he's gonna be a very effective run stopper in the right system. Now Crick used to be an Indomitian Sioux shadow in Nebraska. Then Sue left and Crick still produced. Teams will remember that and they're going to overlook last year's injury and that's a great way to get a bargain. Also, he did well in the bench press of the combine, so people think his chest is healed and I think almost immediately you're going to see the player that you saw two years ago in Nebraska and that's going to be a big success in the NFL. The question is, who will make a more immediate impact? Now this is a very interesting case study because they're different kind of quarterbacks. Luck ran a pro system at Stanford. And Robert Griffin III ran a very spread offense at Baylor. Now you'd think that Luck has an edge there, but you have to look at the teams that are likely to draft them. Let's face it, the Colts are probably going to take Luck, and they are a rebuilding team if there ever was one. They hired Chuck Pagano from Baltimore. They're going to be all about defense. I do not expect to see Luck drop back that often in Indianapolis. They're going to be very conservative. That's really their only chance of winning, so I don't expect them to have a huge rookie year. Now RG3, he could blow up a little bit in Washington. Mike Shanahan has had a lot of success with mobile quarterbacks in the past. And I think that that NFC East is wide open for the taking. Now, it's a lot to say that they're going to win the division. But I think RG3 is going to put up good numbers because even if things break down, he is so fast he can make plays downfield. I think we might see a Pro Bowl season. You know, you saw two rookies with Pro Bowl years last year. RG3 is much more likely than luck to have that kind of year. Is Ryan Tannehill an elite quarterback prospect? The Texas A&M product has been moving up and down mock drafts all offseason long. Now you're seeing as high as number three, assuming that teams might trade up to get ahead of Cleveland at number four to pick the Texas A&M gunslinger. Now here's the problem with Tannehill. You look at the game tape, he had some bad games. He had three three interception games. When you look at RG3 and Andrew Luck, you don't see any of that. When things go wrong at Texas A&M, they go really wrong. I think Tannehill is too cerebral. He gets into his own head and he starts making mistakes late in game. And then of course in the workouts he's great because he's tall and he's strong and he's fast. But at best he's a developmental quarterback because it's all about mentality. Look at Eli Manning and Tom Brady. They're not necessarily the biggest arm or the fastest guy, but they're mentally tough. Tannehill hasn't proven that. He's gonna need time to develop into that kind of quarterback. Problem is you take him in the top 10, you gotta put him on the field and I don't think he's ready.